Every year, Hamilton Native Outpost has a field day to share knowledge of native plants. In 2020, Justin Thomas, a botanist and ecologist with Nature Sight, was the keynote speaker. Although this presentation was at a field day focused on grazing diverse native grasslands, Justin's presentation is relevant to anyone interested in how nature works. Check out other videos from the field day in the video description. In this presentation, Justin begins by talking about healthy people and land, the C-value system which measures how stable a plant community is, and then the group moves outside to look at a grassland and continue the discussion about C-values. If you want to jump or pick back up at a specific part of Justin's presentation, check out the description for start times of different sections. We join the field day as Elizabeth Steele introduces Justin. So we're going Thanks, to first today have uh, Justin speak to us about things to do with like how nature works. And Justin, I would say, in my estimation, is an observer and a thinker. He, by training, is a botanist, which is somebody that studies plants. And he spends a lot of time thinking about how the natural world works. And so it's always interesting to have conversations with Justin because he's always observing and thinking about these things. But I would say that Justin is not somebody involved in agriculture. I think he has some story about helping his uncle pay once. Is that right, Justin? Yeah, at least once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> once at most. <laughs> so his agricultural experience is very limited. So today is a unique opportunity, in my estimation, to have a conversation with Justin. And Justin's going to learn about agriculture from us and grazing and how this sort of stuff works, how grazing animals interact with plants and ecosystems. And from Justin, we're going to learn his observations about plants and ecosystems and how the natural world works. So with that, I will welcome Justin and let him take off. Nice. Thank you. That was, a, that was a nice introduction. I appreciate that a lot. Dana's not with me because I knew if I brought her back to Texas County, I'd never get her back to Green County. <laughs> it's a great place. Dana, uh, Dana's folks and grew up in, uh, around Licking. And, uh, we, we try to get back. Most families moved away, it seems. Um, but yeah, the, the, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a botanist by, by profession. I, I think when you work as a botanist in the wilds of, of anywhere, you start to become a, an ecologist just out of necessity. Um, I've run with that. I, I tend to see the world through plants and then I try to understand how systems work through those plants because they tell a lot of stories. Uh, there's a it's, it's often mind-numbing because the more plants you know, the more it's the world of wounds, right? You start saying, okay, well, this is heavily impacted. There's very little left that exemplifies intact nature as we see it. But then you start to kind of realize, well, maybe that's not such a, maybe that's often the case even in nature. And we'll talk about that a lot. But I've had the, I've had the benefit over the years of, of knowing Amy and Rex and, and, and Elizabeth and Lauren as well. Um, and their observers, they're, the, they're some of the best ecologists I know, and, and I, I often say to folks, ecology is often just a bunch of big words for common sense stuff, and you don't need the big words to understand these simple principles, and most people that are engaged in a landscape, whether it's agriculture or preserving nature preserves, you're, you're observing pretty big trends that just make sense to you over time. So it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot. So I tend to just, just, let's dump the big words that get in the way and let's just talk about the common sense issues of, uh, of systems. So I hope that's what this, this is gonna be. Uh, let's go to the, to the next slide. I, I pulled a, an Alan Savory quote. Um, some people love Alan Savory, some people hate Alan Savory. I'm indifferent. Uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff. But I really do love, you know, in terms of holistic management, the, the principle behind it. And I, I heard him on a, a radio show one time talking, and he, and he basically read this as ultimately like, well, what do we want out of life? What does every human being sort of want? Could we distill that into something? And it's basically this we want stable families living peaceful lives in prosperity and physical safety 
while free to pursue our own spiritual and religious beliefs, adequate nutritious food, clean water, enjoying good education and health, and balanced lives with time for family, friends, community, leisure, and cultural and other pursuits, all, all to be ensured for many generations to come on a foundation of regenerative soils, ethical and humane consideration for all life, and biologically diverse communities on land, lakes, and oceans. I, I don't think you could sum it up. It's a bit lengthy, but I think it gets to the quick of, of, of what any living thing wants in its life. It wants stability. It wants a predictable future that's a beneficial and, a, and a, a prosperous, not necessarily prosperous, but a, a future where, where, where things are stable and good. And that's why I like, I like when we start, the third word in is stable families living peaceful lives and then you, you end it with biologically diverse communities. I think those things go hand in hand um, and a lot. So I've kind of distilled that down into the next slide. I'm moving around too much. Um, the next slide, I kind of distilled it down is, is, is a conversation I was having with a friend of mine. We kind of distilled it down to no organism can be healthier, more stable, or more peaceful than the environment in which it lives, right? So if you're, if you're having a turmoil in, in your lives or your, your community is in turmoil, it's usually because the environment, not necessarily the, the natural environment per se, but wherever you're living is also in turmoil. There's a direct connection between your day-to-day -day happiness and, and hope for your children and the stability and potential of the, li of, of the world around, the environment around you. And so we're, we're going to kind of build on that theme. Uh, is everybody okay with that? I think that's a pretty simple, basic fact of, of any living thing. My dog wants the same thing. A rabbit out in the field wants the same thing. A prairie coneflower wants the same thing. Ragweed wants the same thing. Um, so as a, as a botanist, to me, the world, you, you see it through plants, right? Everything's a plant, and we're, we're just walking plants, and these are plants, and that's a plant. You see the world through plants. And, and it's not such a, a, a big jump. It's not just because I'm a botanist, I see the world through plants. When you look at ecological systems, you start realizing, okay, plants seem to be the crux. If you learn plants, I mean, you can learn insects. They're really complicated and they move around and the, the, the story's a little more confusing. You could, uh, you could study deer you're like, well, you got white-tailed deer. They'll tell you a lot about the world, but it's one sort of organism. And again, they move around and do different things. But plants are a direct expression of exactly where they sit, how they got there, and where they can go, what their potential is. So plants become a really good canaries in the coal mines. Every single one of them has a story to tell. They often occur, a lot of them together. Um, so they have a, a lot to tell. But ultimately, why are they important? is that they're the givers of all life. All life comes through plants. And that may be obvious to some, it was epiphany to me. I, I have two degrees in, in, in biology, one a botany degree, and it was five years ago, it sort of dawned on me, he's like, holy cow, everything that's alive and living is because of plants. How did I not pick that up before? And, and you'll learn in school and in college, or even, just in general, you got primary producers and there's secondary producers. Well, the primary producers are plants and they capture energy from the sun and they convert it into chemical energy. And then we consume that chemical energy in the form of calories and proteins and things like that to fuel everything we do. Every beat of your heart right now, every thought in your head, the energy from that came from a plant somewhere yesterday capturing a photon of light and turning it into chemical energy that we're using to fuel everything we've ever done. All the great art, all the great philosophies of the world, all the great knowledge, the cities we've built, all because plants capture sunlight and then we use it to do work. Um, I think that's, so ultimately, the way plants do that work, the way that energy comes into plants and then expresses through us, like I can, you know, a Twinkie, all the calories in a Twinkie and all the nutrients in a Twinkie derived from a plant energy source at some point in time, just been highly manufactured. If I ate nothing but Twinkies, I wouldn't live very long. But if you're eating homegrown 
organic, rich food and the, and the sort of that savory, what the savory talked about that landscape, you're interacting with your energy source in a different way than you are if you're eating Doritos and Twinkies for every meal. So the way energy moves to that system is, is important. Um, yeah, let's go to the next one. So, so where does all that energy and where does all that mass come from? And I, I always like this because I think it, it, it often highlights this issue for folks, is a, a giant redwood. Where, does, where do plants get their, their mass, their form, their, you know, when you eat a piece of celery, where did that all come from? What is it made of? There's, there's energy and there's mass there. And a lot of folks say, well, they, they pull it out of the soil, the actual material, the wood of something else. The inner, it had to come from another substance, like something out of the soil. But it does it. It comes out of air. All the carbon in wood is from carbon dioxide in the air. Water, they pull up water from the ground. And light, that's all, everything that's ever lived throughout history, every, every heartbeat, every thought of every organism since the beginning of time came from air, water, and sunlight. That's it. And, and I think that's fascinating. Um, in many regards, you might say that it's amazing. Hey. My, uh, it's really cool because I, I like my my kids grasp that now. I was never told anything like that, but I think because maybe it's too obvious. But when I think, well, it's not. If it is obvious, then we're taking it for granted because it's kind of magical, kind of kind of wonderful. So if we if we look at plants and we look at, at life and systems as being the way energy moves through systems and what actually builds things and, and how, how anything that's ever happened happens. It's, 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 a, it's a much more interesting story. So we'll just, let's get into that a little bit more. So, so you've got the potential for life. And then any given place in the world, I threw Missouri on here, but this could be anywhere, is, is you, have, you have living things, that's the biological world. Then you have the abiotic world. So here's the geologic map of Missouri. And you've got kind of the, the light brown, there's the Ozarks, and then the, the, uh, the red in the middle, that's, that's the, the igneous core of the Ozarks, the elephant rocks, Johnson shut-ins, like that part of the world. St. Francis Mountains in general. You got the boot heel, you got the prairies to the north, into the west those 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 phys, those abiotic worlds the rocks and soil and you know whether glaciers came and went or whatever they determine how life expresses itself on a system and that becomes important because it drives the expressions of life and plants adapt to those different places in very different ways Oh, so that's, that's, that's the, that last slide was, think of it as the scale of space, the, the scale of area, right? So there's area, there's, there's life, there's living things, there's the place that it occurs, and then there's also time. Time factors into how these systems behave. Everything is moving forward and building upon itself. So in Missouri, and I'm just gonna use this to highlight, there's been different influences. There were glaciers at one point that pushed uh, northern flora into the area. There were periods where the, the Gulf of Mexico was all the way up to, to the, the boot heel of Missouri. So there was, there were southeastern swamplands and then they receded back south. And every time they'd leave a little piece of those communities, deserts from the west have pushed in and they retreat. So any place that any, you know, every, I do a lot of work all the way throughout the Midwest and even in the Eastern United States and you go to conferences and a lot of talks start with this particular space, Indianapolis, it's a true crossroads of all these ecological systems. And then you go to Memphis, this is a true crossroads of an ecological system. Everywhere you go is a crossroads of ecological systems. There's always, that's the beauty of it, right? It's like nobody's got a, really has a monopoly on where the actual crossroads were. Um, so let's kind of look at the, the influences here and how these things assemble. So now we're starting to assemble communities or ideas of what things are. So you have boreal forests on the left here. If you've been like up in the, the northern Un United States or into the high elevations of the Rockies or even Appalachia, you have boreal expressions. And we have a lot of plants that occur in the Ozarks 
and then 400 miles they're common in those northern northern places those species that we have that are like that are usually things like like cold seepy they call them fins cold wetlands where the groundwater charge is always the same temperature and they're stable and they're cold and at one point they were deposited there then the the rest of the floor and the glaciers went back north and they stayed there because it, it was stable it didn't change right even though even though the uplands they became drier and more acidic and hotter the flora couldn't persist there so they, they died out there but stayed in these cool wet spots because they were very much just like uh, the northern part of the united states i spent the last week down in uh, carter and ripley counties looking at these wetland these thin communities are basically cold water seepages that are big if you've ever been to a fin and i've spent a lot of time in the great lakes and in, in canada looking at fins too and they're the same community when I mean, you stand in them you're like i could be standing in the upper peninsula of michigan right now there it's hundreds of acres and here you got like two acres but looking down it's kind of the same thing eastern deciduous forest there's a lot of influence from things that have evolved and adapted on the appalachian mountains that pop in so we're on the edge of that in a transitional zone next slide about eight eight to five thousand years ago it got really hot and dry Basically what happened is the sun, they think the sun got hotter and it hit the equator hotter. When you heat up the equator, it causes what's called the hypsothermal. The hypsothermal is a, is a, it means high and hot. So you heat the equator really hot and the hot air rises higher and it rolls, but when it convects back down, it pushes the, the air that's in the mid latitudes, the horse latitudes along, along the ocean, it pushes it higher. Well, if you push the mid latitudes higher, our, our weather here in Missouri is driven because Gulf air hits cold air from the north. That's what divides the prairies from the eastern deciduous forest. Gulf air is moist and warm, hits cold northern air, and it wrings the moisture out of it, right? Well, if you push that further north, that rain system doesn't happen, right? It, 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 does, it takes, by the time it starts raining, it's going to be up into Pennsylvania, into this part of the world. So that happened for a couple of thousand years and prairies marched all the way to Western Pennsylvania when that happened. It's why we have, it's why we have glades, which are prairie like communities. And we had prairies, we had extensive prairies in the Ozarks. When that went back, when that balance went back the other way, it left these little crumbs of those systems behind. It's funny if you ever, if you go to like the Buffalo River, drainage in Arkansas, that's kind of where the line is there. There's all the way into western Arkansas, there's beech trees, there's tulip poplars, there's an Appalachian flora. The plants are like Appalachia, especially go to the Wachita's in central Arkansas. In Missouri, our Missouri Ozarks are, are much drier. If you've been to like Ava Glades, the big glade systems are in Branson, those big, big grasslands. Arkansas doesn't have those because that line cut right through there it was still rainy in arkansas but not so much here so you've got that that big influence it's why grasslands are, are more of an issue for us in missouri than they are in you know, pennsylvania or somewhere so again changes and different influences over time we have coastal disjuncts as well so so at warm periods southern things come up so we have a lot of things in the ozarks that, that hold coastal things like there's a there's an orchid there um, most of them are, are unusual things down at uh, just south of Eminence Missouri there's a wetland fen complex and there is a giant patch of sawgrass growing in the middle of it 400 miles from the nearest patch of sawgrass sawgrass is the thing in the Florida Everglades and it's the only pot it's 400 miles there's not another one around anywhere and you wonder well has it always been there? You're like, well, maybe it came in on birds or something, but at your feet are these other little, little grasses and forbs. They're also from there, from Southern Florida or Castaway. And then right next to them are species that are only known from Canada growing right there with them. So you've, you've got these things that had to have taken thousands of years to, to get there. And then once they got there, it had to be stable and the community couldn't have changed even when the hips of thermal was happening and the south was coming. Those spots, because of the cold water discharge 
and their place on the landscape, they always stayed the same. So that's this, this, this is the stability sort of dynamic that we're going to talk, talk more about. Oh, other influences, desert southwest, if you've been on glades, or you've been, in, uh, especially like Ava glades, southwestern part of the Missouri, we've got tarantulas. Click it, there's a little animation there for the next. There we go. We got tarantulas, <laughs> we got road runners, we got collared lizards, we got this southwestern flora expression um, as well. So it's this crossroads that's, that's, we have a unique way that those crossroads happen, but those crossroads happen anywhere. You know, it's just, it's just life. Patterns, big patterns make smaller patterns that influence other patterns. So, you know, we're special in the way we have patterns, but I think it's, I think it's, we miss the bigger issue that this is how life expresses itself all over the, all over the world. You know, except for life is a, you know, deserts, even though like a really just a pure sand desert, there's often still life there at some scale. Um, okay. Okay, so now we've, we've gone from all living things to sort of a, a reference frame of putting it on the landscape. Well, what do they do once they're there? So we've, we've, got, we've, got living, we've got living things, we've got the space they live in, the time frame they live in. When they're there, how do they interact? So this is another sort of take on it. So the major, the major forces in ecology determine the way plants are and how they interact. There's sort of four main things here. These would be real common sense. Um, these are actually the ecological terms for them, but they're terms we use every day. We know, you know what stability is, you know what stress is. You can get an idea of disturbance and damage. But we'll look at these each individually, so next slide. Stability, when you see, this is a prairie in uh, Northwest Arkansas, Flanagan Prairie, one of the most amazing places I've ever been. It's just, life is just literally buzzing and teeming and alive at the spot. You'll never find, it's one of those few places, or one of the places where you'll find the most plants and animals and everything just kind of interacting um, in one, one given point in time because it's been really stable for a really long time. Again, the longer something is stable, the more things can adapt to it. Just like, I mean, the reason you want to know what the weather is next week is because you want to know what, whether, how stable your life is going to be. And when the weather is bad next week, you're like, ah, oh, darn it. You've disrupted the stability that I was hoping for. I was hoping for a perfectly smooth this or that or the other. And that's how life is, right? Life's always throwing chaos and messing up your plans, but your hope is that there's a baseline that I can, there's a tempo to the song that I can dance to. You can't dance to a song unless there's a beat. That's the first part of a song is the beat. And then you add stuff to it. The longer that beat goes, the more things you add to it, the more complex the song gets, the more it turns, starts turning into a more complex song. That said, it's, it's also nice. Some of the most basic, simple songs you ever heard are, are the best ones. You know, uh, Willie Nelson said, uh, the trick to songwriting is three, song, uh, three chords and a broken heart. That's all you need, three chords and a broken heart. Uh, stress, so stress happens. Floods happen, droughts happen, uh, tornadoes happen, a little different. Um, insect populations, fungal populations, bad things happen, you know, but you don't expect, you, you kind of expect them to happen, right? Like if somebody said, hey, next week it's gonna be, 100 degrees and rainy, it's going to be a sawn out. You're like, well, I guess. I wasn't hoping for that, but that could happen. It's a bit early for June. And if somebody said it's going to be, man, it's going to be low 70s, low humidity, it's going to be gorgeous. You're like, oh, wow, that's what I was hoping for. The truth is usually somewhere in the middle. You know, somebody said, you know, you prepare for it. If somebody said, hey, there's a tornado on the way, imagine there's a plan for what we would do. We'd know, okay, we're going to go over here. We'd have a response to that. We don't expect the tornado to come, but if it did, we'd be ready for it because we're used to their, the possibility of a tornado coming, right? That's stress. And that's what and plants get used to it. So you get grasses that are adapted to stress. You, get a, you build a community with enough plants you have enough animals, you have the system that can, can tolerate the fluctuations and the surprises um, that happen just in life, just like you do in your life. Plant communities are kind of the same way. They 
And so the stress in ecology in these systems are the things that happen often enough that the, that the system is prepared to handle it. And that forms the kind of often, it, stress is often the te, one of the tempos, one of the beats that drives the song of a community. Good. Disturbance slash damage. Disturbance is used, disturbance is a bad word in ecology. It, it's being used very, it means two completely different things and people are talking about it as though it doesn't and it just confuses matters. So I stop using disturbance. Um, when people talk about like, oh, you need fire in, a, in, a, in the Ozarks because it, it, it gives a disturbance that makes the system happy, that's more of a stress. If you're talking about something that happened historically, that that community is used to a repeated pattern of something, that's not a disturbance. You're not, you're not altering the way the system works. You're working within the system and it stresses out some trees, it stresses out a few things, but it's within the system's knowledge of how things work. Other people use disturbance as damage. This destroyed this or that or the other. And this slide's kind of a good example. This is, this is over at Prairie State Park. And this is, the, this is the property line. This is a private landowner who owns this prairie patch. And this on the right is the state park itself. This spot, ten, 15 years ago, there was no difference between. The, they, they'd purchased this, this, this addition to Prairie State Park from this landowner that they kept a little, a little 10 acre hold that, in holding that they, uh, they used as a hay prairie. Well, the hay prairie over here is kind of a, it's a, it's a stress, they hay it, it's a bit of a stress on it, but the system's kind of attuned to that, it doesn't really mess it up too much. But on the other side, it's receiving damage, and, and I don't want to go into the crazy details, but essentially, they, anytime you start seeing plants that are indicative of damage expressed, that's the warning sign that something's going on. I mean, some of you may be, may be, uh, may be uh, ranchers or your, your farmers or whatever you know. You learn like, oh, holy cow, if I'm getting too much of, we have increasers and decreasers. You're getting a lot of the bad things and a lot of the good things. You learn to adjust that so that you have some stability in your system, right? Ecologists don't have that. We're just like, oh, we know everything about nature. We're going to do whatever we want. Fire was a thing. So we just, we do these big things, but we rarely have that direct, it's, it's, it's tight of a connection as I think we should have, or it would be nice to have. Um, the, uh, and it's not on purpose, but, but this, this side of the fence for a couple of years was being burned really late in the year. And what happens is, historically, it seems like fires were all really, dormant season when Native Americans would, would light fires, it'd be in the winter. And you just burn off the biomass, the dead litter, and then it would rain and snow in the winter, and that flush of nutrients would kind of get washed off the, off the system, and everything would wake up in the spring and grow really well. But if you burn like in March, April, um, what happens is, you create all that nutrient from all that ash, all that burned material, as it's getting warm and as plants are, are coming up, and they, they, it causes things like sumac to germinate. And all of a sudden you've got a, a prairie like this that's woody free, it has healthy grass in it. You start, you start getting a system that's solid sumac. If you've been in prairies in the western part of, the, of Missouri, you may have noticed in the last 10 years, most of them are becoming sumac oceans. And, it, and this, this appears to be why that is happening. So we got to adapt. We, you know, I often joke when we drive through uh, northern Missouri or Illinois, like, well, these, it, hey, look, it's still prairie. It's a corn prairie now, but it's still grassland, right? Corn's a grass. You trade all that diversity for one crop, you know, throw some soybeans in there, you got a legume. Um, that's, that's what happens when you completely disrupt the system. It's not even recognizable as a natural functioning system anymore. Invasive species do this too. Bush honeysuckle, if you've been around St. Louis, Kansas City, where there's a lot of bush honeysuckle in the spring and fall, you see it more. Um, it comes in, that natural system is used to light coming in and, and then the living system, the organisms and the pollinators using all that energy, again, it's light being turned to plant energy that everything else uses that. Invasive species come in and they, they, use, they, they cut it off. They usurp every, the system and change the way energy flows through it. Nothing eats bush honeysuckle, 
And therefore, if it's consuming all the light energy, then everything else is just going to die, and all you basically are left with is bush honeysuckle. Over time, things will start to nibble on bush honeysuckle, and things will learn, the, the, the soil will start to, uh, microbes will start to do things with it. But that, that takes hundreds of years, and we don't have hundreds of years to, to wait. So we, so we try to remove or dis discourage invasive species in general. So, <clears throat> this isn't hard stuff. I think most of us, I think there's a human ability. I think it's just, I think, I, I think it's not even a human ability. I think a cow or a horse or a rabbit or chicken can recognize a system that's closer to a stable and rich complex thing. You don't have pictures of a clear cut forest on your calendar with stumps and tangled messes. Like, oh look, it's nature, it's beautiful. We were, we were just, yesterday we were up at a place above Eminence that a bunch of squatters, they, they, they got clear cut, this ridge top got clear cut um, five years ago, so it's just kind of a messy growth of, of clear cut uplands. But there were squatters in there, they had like tarp tents and just kind of these rough, rough folks living up there. And we asked ourselves, do, do they think this is beautiful nature? Because I don't know if they do, or they may. I, 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 as you become a botanist and maybe an ecologist, kind of diverge. You don't know what people think is nature anymore. But I think people can see, okay, you know, which, which one of these threes is a more stable, like a rich, complex, the, the sort of, like we, going back to Savory's concept of, of biodiverse, ethical, um, regenerative, stable, sustainable system. And we've got one, Option two and option three. Um, pick one. I'm like, we're not going to pull the audience or anything, but um, there's no prize if you get the right one. Look under your chairs. There's a. There's a number three, in and from an ecologist perspective, when I look at it as like, how does the most life in its most complex forms, and all of the most wonderful ways that, that nature can use energy and express itself in a stable way, which one of these threes is, is, is an example of that? It's three. Is it better? No, that's, that's relative. But in terms of an e ecologically demonstrating, three is, one is a pretty hard grazed prairie, that's Pawnee Prairie in Northern Missouri, pretty hard grazed. Um, that, that's kind of getting into that disturbance, even damage sort of landscape. You, know, you can't, I'm not, I'm not saying that grazing is bad at all. I'm just saying that it, it can be pushed. Grazing can be a stressor, it can be a stabilizer, and it can be a damager. And I think anybody, who, you, know, you guys know that, what am I saying? Um, two, this is, uh, this is uh, High Lonesome Prairie in, uh, is that Morgan County maybe? Central Missouri. Um, the white in there is daisy fleabane. As a botanist, I walk out of there and I see, okay, there's a bunch of daisy fleabane. That's usually a weedier, damaged sort of species indicator. But there's also some cone flower around. And like, well, there's still, there's still some still tempo there. There's still a heartbeat. Whereas something like this, this is 25 mile outside of a Humansville. Um, it's a natural area. It always looks really wonderful and expressive. You know, it's, it's, you have species, you have species that are indicative of stable systems in abundance, coexisting. If you wanted to find a rare, if you want to go to a prairie and find a rare butterfly, moth, bee, spider, yada yada, if you wanted to go to a prairie and find the most highly complex soil microbia, you'd probably go here. <laughs> Rooster agrees. That, uh, that, that, uh, because it's just been there, it's been stable, and been, 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 it, it's more ecologically complex, and we'll come back to complexity as well. Go ahead. So how do we know that? What do we do? How do we measure that? What do, how do, I mean, who's to say? Who are you to say that daisy fleabane is a weed? Well, when you, when you start looking at these systems, and you see how they, how they respond to disturbance, stress, damage, and stability. You say, okay, wait, there are plants that respond to this, and there are plants that respond to that. There are, there are plants that respond to this on acid soil, but not on alkaline soil. 
So that, that's kind of a, where a botanist starts becoming an ecologist because you, you can't separate those phenomena um, from each other. So what we've done, this was developed in the, in the late 70s, um, including by, by Doug Ladd in Missouri was a big, big influence on this system, is we've given them a number. We've given numbers to how they relate to each other. So the, low, the things that respond to damage, we give low numbers. And the things that we only find in like those finny seeps that are 400 miles from the nearest population, those pieces of Canada that were left in Missouri, just like you have like those glacial erratics in northern Missouri, a glacier came down and pushed a big granite boulder in somebody's yard and then left. We have communities that are like that. Those communities, those plants that grow there that are only there because it was stable since that time, we give high numbers to. They indicate antiquity, they indicate complexity, they indicate life expressing itself at a at its more complex relationship. And it's at its most beautiful song, in my opinion. Yes, sir. These values you're giving to an area. Correct? Yes. Or yeah. They're, they're, they're the most most of the most of the most of them are uh, are state specific. So Missouri's got all the all the all the plants that occur in the wild, exotics and natives, are given a number in the state of Missouri. But then, like in the southeastern United States, they have like a southeastern list. But most states have a state list. It's not perfect. It's a bit sloppy. There's been Academics hate it. Statisticians think it's ridiculous. Missouri Department of Conservation, their natural history biologists use it and can't, can't get by without it, but a, the Department of Conservation will, will not let it be used to make management decisions because the statisticians don't like it. It's mathematically, you know, you're just assigning a number. It's like saying, what's the mathematical difference between yellow and blue? There's not really a mathematical difference. You can pretend there is. You can make a gradient of green between them, but is green a five and zero? You know what I mean? But people that use it, I use it all the time. Like this is really the best way to understand these systems. It just works. It's one of those situations. And I could defend it. It'd take me an hour to ramble off. But it has been, it, it, one of the defenses like this, uh, I, I cite a couple of papers here. Um, so there are some academics that do like it. And what they've done, and they said, okay, if something's a five, if you're giving this plant a five, then it should, it should occur with other fives. And if something's a 10, it shouldn't occur with zeros. Like you couldn't have an area the size of a, this table and you'd have a bunch of zeros and a bunch of tens. That wouldn't make any sense. You, would, you should have maybe one zero and one 10 and a bunch of, it would be a bell curve. You'd have fours and fives being the most common thing. So they did, they did these statistical analyses where they, they took huge data sets where people had collected quadrat level data and they said, okay, when somebody had a two, what did it most often also, what, what were the other species with it? And what they found is that twos occur with twos threes occurs with, occur with threes, fives occur with fives, that it was a direct, there was a strong correlation with how everything worked together, which, which defends it as an actual, it is a predictable system. Science and, and statistics is all about predictability. It's weather, what's tomorrow gonna be, and it's in, in a world where chaos and, and, and weird things happen. So it, it has predictive value, whether it's mathematically sound, doesn't matter to me. Um, I mean, it does in the sense that it defends it, but um, you can get really hung up on the on the stats, the statistics, and the, the things. Um, but we use it, and it's about, it's the only way you can meaningfully quantify. And we've used it. I've used it for for 20 years. The average. Here's what we find. It's a zero to ten thing. You want most systems are. We, I, I usually put it in sort of social context. The fours, the sixes. Those, that's your blue collar workforce. That's that's the that's the middle class. You want strong in your in your in your in your community. That's out there working, creating jobs. Your small business owners. Your guy that just goes to work and just pounds it out at the factory every day and, and gets a gets a gets a good wage for it. Um, that's your that's the backbone of your system. But then you got the zeros and threes that are there for when stress and damage happens 
because stress and damage does happen, life has made something that fills that niche. But there are not many of those things. Less than 10% of our flora falls into that zero to three category. 90% of our flora is fours or higher. But again, and even in even the most rich, beautiful, complex, stable system, there's only a couple sevens and tens sevens through tens. It's mostly a big blue, like, like think of a prairie with big blue stem. Big blue stems, I think a five. Little blue stems, a four. That's the, that's the matrix, that's the, that's the structure that sets up that community. Then it's a matter of how much ragweed you have versus how much compass plant you have. This is sort of the, the tipping, what, what moves that average. And we find that average hits at about four for like really stable intact systems. When we do restoration, when we come to a site and we say, is this prairie worth restoring? If that average C value is under three and a half, it's gonna take a lot of work. If it's above three and a half, it's like, okay, we don't have to do much. This still, this still has the potential. It has all the pieces that are there together and, and they, it has the memory to instantly come back together. And we see that quickly on prairies. Same in, in woods. You know, if you're living in a community where, where white oak is the common tree, white oak is four or five C value, it's the, it's the backworm. Most of our oaks, black oaks, red oaks, you know, the, the oak hickory forest that we live in, most of those are all fours and fives. In a forest, those are the things that dominate the system. And then it's a matter of how much fireweed you have versus how much, I don't know, yellow lady slipper you have in those systems. So the, it, it was funny because when you break that matrix, when you break the blue collar workforce of the system, that's when chaos and disruption happens in those systems. So ultimately we want to protect that, that middle ground. And if something's stable long enough, you get the high end. If it's hit too hard, you get the low end. Am I talking too much about this subject? <laughs> it's a fascinating subject because it, it's, it, sounds, it sounds subjective and it sounds abstract, but it is concrete, it is, it, is a, it, it, is, it is as concrete as your lives are in terms of how predictable things are into the future. The, we can predict how a system's going to behave, how a prairie or a woodland's going to behave, in the same way that you can predict your five-year plan. Hey, I've got a five-year plan. Here's, here's what I hope to happen. You don't know what the future's going to be, but we can usually target these things pretty close and direct them towards a certain direction. Without this number system, you got nothing. All plants are the same. Ragweed's the same thing as a yellow lady slipper. So, so you're kind of, you kind of, if you're going to accept that there are increasers and decreasers, you got to, you got to sort of find a way to make it usable. It's, it's a utility thing. Uh, just a few examples here. Uh, like this is Scutellaria bushii. Bush's skull cap, only found in the Ozarks, only on glades. When it's on those glades, they're beautiful, intact, complex. You'll find rare bugs, you'll find rare animals, you'll find rare everything where that thing occurs. You see bush, bush skull cap on a glade, you're like, okay, this is ecology at its most stable and its most complex, for whatever that's worth. Hypoxis hirsuta, kind of the same way. Viola cuculata, it's a wetland thin thing, it's a C10. Echinacea simulata, our glade uh, coneflower in the Ozarks. Uh, it's about a seven, you know, you can have a kind of a, you know, it's, think of it as there's a seven chances out of 10 when I see that I am on a nice glade. Not always, but often. Seeing it doesn't mean it's a nice glade, it means probably, it's a probability, right? If you get a bunch of those probabilities together, you're increasing your probability. You're increasing your predictability. Blackberries, most blackberries are, are zeros and ones. You know, that's probably not a surprise to folks. They're delicious. I like blackberries. I find a big patch of them and yeah. you know, on 4th of July, I'm, I'm loading up on them. And birds love them. They're, I think people start to think, well, we're putting a value system or, a, or an importance value on these things. And there is that human tendency. I. Consciously, I'm always trying to say that doesn't matter. That's not what we're doing. We're just basically saying they're indicative of, of how they work together. A one is just as important as a 10, just in a different way. 
and, and, and it's understanding the way that makes this useful. If you don't understand the way it's useful, then you're just wasting your time. But if you can understand that a one is, is important as a 10, just different way, then, then, you, can, then you can use it. Ash, juniper, you know, we have eastern red cedar. What do, you th well, what do you think eastern red cedar is for C value? Zero, yeah, negative number. We could do negative here. Why? Anybody want to go bold and say four? I'm going at least two. He's going two. It's with ragweed. Ragweed, again, with ragweed on the end of the spectrum. It, it's, I think it's a one. Could I defend my two? But you had, well, you had, let's see. Yeah. Well, see, this is how this is done. Like, these numbers are assigned by a bunch of people. Somebody will say one, somebody will say a two, and somebody will say a zero, and they usually will just, we'll all average it out, and it'll be a one. And that makes, you're like, okay, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. <laughs> you can lobby. We'll give you some lobby money. You can spread it around and see what, good. Pardon me? So ash juniper is on the edge of its range. So you get into Oklahoma and uh, Texas and it's just as weedy as okay. eastern red cedar. But in Missouri, it's, it's, uh, it's not quite fit for the climate. So when you do find it, it's like in a really protected thing. So that's, that's one of the other weird things about this thing too, is when you get to the edge of the range of a species, it, it's not, it doesn't behave the same as it does at the core of its species. That said, that should probably be a four at most. We're, we're, we're about every 10 years we try to change these numbers. 2015, we redid the numbers, and three days later, it was like, oh, we need to change this one or this one or this one. Red cedar Yeah, red cedar, I think, is a one. Yep. And it's deserving of that. It, it ecologically, it's the ragweed of trees, I often say, and, and it is. Um, we could go on a, a long time about eastern red cedar. That said, I will defend eastern red cedar. Again, we're putting a value judgment on it, but eastern red cedar is doing what it has evolved to do. It, it knows that somewhere in the world there will be chaos, and it makes birds food, and the birds poop it all over, and those seeds sit in the ground for 100 years, and eventually chaos is going to happen, and it's going to germinate, and it's going to be there. We have to, just like, it's, it's almost like cursing your, your blood for making a scab. Like, oh, I got these darn scabs. I wish my blood wouldn't scab. Well, be careful what you wish for, because you need scabs, right? <laughs> when we have nothing but scab and scar tissue, that's when it becomes an issue. So it's not the plant's problem. It's how we react, how we interact with our landscape that's the problem in this sense. So, I mean, but I, I know it's an easy target. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm looking for the compass plant value. Oh, uh, I think it's a six or seven. Yeah, is it a six? A, a six on there? Yeah, it's cut off a little bit. Justin. Yeah. You know, on, on the northern uh, Nebraska and Iowa River. Okay. There's there has been a big project to remove those cedars. Mm -hmm. But cattle going down to the river to drink have been used that slope over time. And what will we have if we didn't have those cedars to protect the slope? Right. Exactly. So Willows. Yeah. I, when I, I do, do work and used to do more work in uh, Indiana and Illinois on wetland mitigation. So, you know, highway needs to go through here. It goes through a wetland. They impact the wetland. They fill it in. And, they, and this, so they build another wetland somewhere else. They usually buy a farm field, bust tile, and, and, and hold water. Well, then the state regulations and the federal regulations for Clean Water Act are that... Well, that has you. If you destroyed a really nice, high-quality wetland with a bunch of high C-value plants, you got to make that out of the farm field, and within five years, it's a five-year permitting process. So you got you got five years to make that farm field look like that high-quality wetland that took ten thousand years, and and you know, and it goes to it goes to the point that, that the people making the policy and a lot of these things don't understand the actual dynamic. They're getting better. But you, know, you hear about Clean Water Act being caught up in the, in the courts and things like that. And this is why, because it's really not, you know, there's a problem there, but the problem, you know, it'll be locked up for a long time because the rea nobody's really looking at what's really going on. It's just two sides fighting about something that have nothing to do with what's really going on in the landscape and nobody wants to give up. Um, but, but what they'll do is, you know, you'll build a farm field a wetland and a farm field, abandoned farm field, 
and it'll instantly colonize with willows and cottonwoods. Well, those are zeros and ones. And you destroyed a, a, a Schumard, Pin Oak, Black Ash wetland. Those are all fives and tens. You gotta plant those in there. Well, so they're planting in, they're spending all this money planting these expensive trees and the whole place is just gonna become willows. And so they go in and they spray the willows and they kind of get it to look like it's supposed to. Five year period permits up and they get the stamp. Okay, you did it. They walk away. A year later, it's all willows and cottonwoods. It has to go through that system for it to happen. And so we, you know, we, we, we have all these still silly loopholes that people have to jump through that ends up in litigation. And then people are like, why would you be against the Clean Water Act? It's like, well, it's not that people don't want, it's not that people don't want clean water, it's just we're not doing it the right way. Yada, yada, right? That's, that's, that's our lives, right? So a lot of this, again, I hope a lot of this is, has been common sense to this point. I think this is, this is one of my, the, the confidence knowledge dynamic works a lot. And, and, a, and when you don't know anything, about something instantly you're like oh hey i know i know a little bit about this like i don't know anything about what was i trying to learn the other day i got a, i got an 11 year old son who since the day he was born was just infatuated with computers and technology that's not my thing at all you know and uh you know it's to the point where i'm like well i feel like i know a little something about computers i know how to download this and yada yada but as my kids as he gets older and knows more i'm realizing i'm i know i know very very little about many subjects in life which is is good but but as you become aware of things you ultimately end up just like what we were talking about a second ago it's complicated but under that complication there are some there are some trends of truth or kernels of truth that you learn along the way. You basically, I think the, the knowledge and confidence thing is a matter of being on the, on the right side there is knowing what the major trends are and knowing when you're wrong. We, we always, botanists are always like, what makes somebody a good botanist? You know, always kind of testing our muster against each other. What makes somebody a good botanist? Um, and Doug Ladd years ago told me what I like the best is a good botanist is a, is a botanist that knows at plant identification we're talking, right? How do you know if somebody's a good at plant identification? And Doug said, you know somebody's a good botanist when they know what they don't when they don't know what something is. Like you hand them a plant and they're like they don't make it, they don't make it fit into a hole in their head that's like, oh, this is the, in my mind that's the closest thing to that is Timothy grass. That must be Timothy grass. It's somebody that looks at something they've never seen before that might be like Timothy grass and they say, I don't know what that is. It's kind of like Timothy grass, but it's not. That's, that's somebody who's, who's kind of aware that this is more complicated than it really should be and I can't just make simple claims. There's nuance, right? That's kind of the difference. That subtlety though makes all the difference in the world. Uh, remember this shape of this graph, because we're going to come back to it in a second. There's one more graph. <laughs> Go ahead. So anyway, we take those numbers and we start applying it to the field. I, I hire a crew every year. College kids get younger every time I do it. I don't know how this happens. <laughs> Maybe it's me. I'm getting older. <laughs> we, uh, we hire uh, usually young folks out of college, try to give them some education on field work, because people don't do field work in ecology very very little of it or it's, or it's not you know this whole week since middle of march every day of the work week i've been out doing that and with me are two 20 year olds who are just doing it for a summer job but i, I pick really good people that are going to do it they're really into it right um most 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 jobs like this most ecology of learning plants in the field what you what, what a rancher does on it for a living um, is kind of how I feel about what I do for quadrat work. These are my these are my 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 transect is my 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 field that I'm monitoring how things are going. The data I collect is me interacting and learning, and that does this time. This project I've been on for 20 years now, which is weird for me to say, but things that I've seen like wow that wasn't like that. The data may not reflect it. Um, I'm, there's nobody, I'm not bragging, I'm not saying, most people do the type of work I've been doing, 
for a year, a season or two, and then they go get an academic job or they get an office job, and then they start making decisions. And I cringe at the thought of me making decisions my second year after field work. You know, I mean, you'd get the big stuff right, but you'd miss what's important. I cringe at the thought of it now. It's, it's, it's literally the most humbling thing you can do because um, it's so complex and it's so fascinating, but you start to see at least more of the trends and I, I still love it, so I still do it. I, I, I tell people I'm the, old, I'm the oldest living intern that's uh, somehow, somehow managed to pay my bills. I don't know how to. Good man. Yeah, thank you, yeah. I think it's, to me, it's like this is salt of the earth. This is as real as you can possibly get. To me, it's like, if you want the most stability and happiness in, your, in anything, it's your life or your work, don't deceive yourself. Don't take big concepts and just run with them and don't fall into the, con, into the, into the convention of what, things, what people do. Interact with it. Have your own ideas and share them with people and shape them and you know, grow as a person and a scientist. Um, so anyway, we collect data and we run these numbers and we see these trends and we see very wonderful trends. We, see, we start to see amazing patterns in the way life expresses itself and we start to see those patterns are very much the way that my life expresses itself as I get older, as my finances express themselves, as the termites eating my shed express themselves. You start to see these are common trends just in living things. They're not related to this is nature and it's perfect. This is Eden. It's not that. It's, it's the same pattern is going on in a beat up, a landfill that's been capped over, an old you know, beat up whatever. The process is still the same. There are these processes. Go ahead. Um, so we apply them to places like this. This is a, this is a, uh, a grazed hot fence there. There's a gray side and an ungrazed side. These are different states that a system can be in. This is actively not being grazed. That is not. That's a dynamism. As long as, as, long as that system, I mean, there's, there's people that are against grazing on prairies and stuff. But as long as there's, there's no, you can't doubt that there were grazing animals on these. So you can apply these to situations like that. Fire, fire changes the landscape. It can be a stress. Fire can be a damaging force. Fire can be a. You got five minutes. I got five minutes. Holy cow! That could be a disruptive, disruptive force. So fire can be. Fire can be stabilizing. Fire is amazing because it can do, you can do, you can run the gamut with it um, in terms of what it does. But most people, the convention is fire is good no matter what. You can't do wrong with fire. I go out with people all the time like, oh, if this could burn, it would burn. So you know, be out in July, oh, we could burn this in July. We should, maybe we should burn it in July. I've seen places that have been burned in July. It's not good. They're set back. Anything, any of that, Stable antiquity dynamism that that system had is gone. It's in a tailspin of chaos. And sure, that happened historically, but when we have, you know, less than 1% of, of our natural systems left in the world, we don't want to see the last of them fall under uh, things that are that destructive. The ratios are different. Go ahead. Uh, another example this is a nine mile prairie outside of Lincoln, Nebraska. 2012, they started to do growing season burns on a, on a high quality prairie. Check out the uh, checkered, follow the checkered water tower on the skyline there. So this is what it looked like in 2012. This is what it looked like two years ago. Sumac, all over, there's the water tower in the back. It's just solid sumac now. You don't burn sumac out. You can't get rid of the sumac, it's there. How do you, I mean, you, you can't get rid of it. Also, when you start looking around, all the high C value stuff also gone. So you've, you've taken this system that was stable and had a C value of about four, four and a half, and it's instantly shot down or in a couple of years down into the threes. That's fine when there's 10, 10 million acres of prairie. It, you know, that would have happened. It would just recolonize. But this is, this is 50 acres outside of an urban area. You don't recolonize that. It's gone forever. And now it's sumac. You know, they'll, they'll probably herbicide it out once they realize what's happening. Uh, if they don't, it's going to turn into a forest, just like behind it. Next slide. So I turn one. Oh, that's, so there's another shot of it. 
It's, it's a smooth sumac they get there. Flip, yeah, go ahead. Flip around 180, this is, there's a fence behind me. This is outside, this is where they got like a, a, an old uh, ammunition storage facility behind the place where they don't do that. They just, they've basically just been mowing in the back. Not a speck of sumac on it. There's a lot of research coming out of Kansas, K-State, Kansas State University saying that the sumac increase on Flint Hills and these prairie systems is because of CO2 and climate change. And it's like, well, why is this place exempt from CO2 increases? Our, our Missouri Prairie Foundation prairies, they don't have the added CO2, but right next door on the other prairies owned by other folks, they do. This is not a, I mean, science gets sticky. Anyway, uh, so basically one of the great things we've come down with with, with, with all of the, the research we've looked at and using native sea value is a, uh, you know, picture this as zero and make the, it's not the other end is 10, but it's increasing C value. So as, as C value goes up, as you get higher C values, things like diversity, they also go up. Richness goes up and evenness goes up. So, so start here, this is starting, let you say you got a, say it's Little House on the Prairie, Pioneers is millions of acres. You plow up 10 acres for a, for a farm. And then you decide, no, I want to put it over here. And so you abandon that, right? So that's just been tilled up. What's going to happen is, first thing that's going to happen are, are weeds. So you've got zero plants. It's bare soil. Or you can think of this as your garden. Um, plants start, start, start colonizing it, right? So richness, the number of species, how many species there are. So first shows up some ragweed and pokeweed and... You know, any kind of thing with weed in the common name is probably a weed. You start getting more and more of them, so you're increasing in, in, in the number of things and the diversity of those things to a point. Well then, in this little house on the prairie scenario, big blue stem finally makes it onto the scene. This is all nutrient driven. You plow something up, you get a flush of nitrogen out of the soil. Eventually those weedy things will eat, start, the nitrogen will start going down. When the nitrogen starts going down, all of a sudden ragweed, pokeweed, they don't have, they can't live as easily because they're nutrient hogs. Big blue stem can live on a little bit of nitrogen. So it starts, it starts populating the spot and running out all the weedy stuff. Richness and diversity start going down. So you're losing species, but you're gaining quality. So you've traded a bunch of ones and zeros for a dominant four and five. And that reaches a point here where that thing becomes the dominant thing. This is like prairie restoration. There's a couple of years there where it's weedy, doesn't look like anything, and all of a sudden it turns into a, more looking like a prairie. Well, then you've probably got a couple of years where the grasses are gonna dominate and eat up. And then it's those later years where the high C value rare thing, not, not even rare, just the late, the things that pollinators need, you know, violets, echinacea, these things, they start coming in and then richness and diversity start going up, right? So say this richness is, say it's just, richness is the number of species. Say I said, hey, I, I went out into that field and there's a hundred species. Based on this graph, what does that tell you? I found a hundred species out there, isn't that something? Is that something? If it's 100 species here, it's very different than 100 species there. And that's the kind of dynamic that, that we talk about when it comes to how species express themselves on a landscape. If you've got 100 weeds, I wouldn't give you a nickel for them. If you've got 100 late successional system that's, that's harboring and running. You know, you've got my, microbes that are working in the soil that take long term, long time to, it's the same with the microbes in the soil. The generalist microbes, I mean, in reality, this is really an expression of how the microbes have colonized the soil. This end, you have a lot of microbes in, in the soil. Here you got fewer. Here you got just weedy things to get to the middle. Does that make sense? So it's a general ecological perspective of, of how nature works, but common sense, it's not, it's not complicated. Um, yeah, so, so back to this again. It's funny that this follows the same curve, right? Both of these spectrums, you think you know something, and in the middle you don't know much. 
until you start forming solid ideas. And then you start building on those ideas to understand the nuance and the complexity of the system. You know, our, the way we conceptualize things is that same flow pattern, that wave, it's a wave. Oh, and then I like the, this is the Aldo Leopold quote, that's basically the same as Alan Saber's quote, is the thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity and stability and beauty of the biotic community. I think you could put human community in there as well, because there's our own ethical lives are tied to this as well. Because we can't live, no organism can live in a system that is not a healthy system for long, at least not equally. Um, and when it's wrong, it, it tends to be otherwise. I, th I think that's, that's a, a good way to sum up most of this. Yes, thank you. She's like, I didn't know you could do characters from pictures. Like, yeah, we can do that. So yeah, feel free. Use me up, do what you gotta do. Uh, here's the list. We talked about C values this morning. The, um, the, the whole system's called the, the Floristic Quality Assessment Program. And so that's all, it's double page. These are the plants that occur in your state. You know, these are the people in your neighborhood song. These are the plants in your neighborhood. There's uh, roughly 3,200 species of wild occurring plants in the state boundaries of Missouri. Um, two thirds of those are native. So a third of our flora is exotic, which is kind of surprising. Um, and so for the exotic ones, they get an asterisk. They don't tell us anything about the native natural ecology of the place, so we don't give them a C value. Uh, they're treated as zeros, actually, from different analyses. But then all the others get a, get a number assigned to them between zero and ten, like we said. Yes, sir? Justin, is that list available online? This list is online. Um, I'll tell you what you can do. If you guys if you want to look for it, it's, uh, it's published in an online journal. The journal is called Fido Neuron. <laughs> yeah, which literally means plant nerd. Yeah. P-H-Y-T-O. N E U R O N. Phytoneuron. Type in phytoneuron and um, Justin Thomas uh, 2015, 2015 is when it came out. And it should be the first hit. It's a PDF. You pop it up. It's about 300 pages, 200 pages. Um, the end of it is this. There's a lot of a lot of yammering up front. But a lot of the work we do, in order to understand how these things, how these systems interact, a lot of what like Elizabeth was talking about a while ago with that structural element, how they sort, how things co-occur at this scale, we use this. You know, when I'm not plumbing, I'm making quadrats. <laughs> you can lay this down and see what plants grow in them. There's a, there's a natural history biologist in Illinois who just retired, Jack White. He's done a few talks at the Missouri Botanical Symposium. And he did a, he's doing a really fun project where he has several of these. And he's, the guy is like, you know, out there, geniusy, very patient guy. But he's built this thing called the plantograph. It's basically a scaffolding over the prairie where he can lay over the prairie and put down a quadrat and slide a camera on this, on this track. And he's removing a centimeter at a time and taking pictures of how things are laying. And he, he has these great images of, of exactly what Elizabeth was talking about is this plant fits right in the gap between big blue stem and rosin weed. And this one always fits right in this, you know, and these are like really high quality prairie systems. When you, that's one of those, when you disturb a prairie and kind of tangle that up, you kind of get that randomness, like even, these patches are mostly natives, but whenever you see something, like when we walked in, there was, a, there was some brome, some exotic bromes. You're like, well, that doesn't fit into the puzzle. That's an odd piece. It has no evolutionary history with these systems. It doesn't fit. It hasn't been shaped by the community over time. It can. It will take thousands of years, but it can happen. But mostly what we do is we lay down <coughs> these, usually in plot form. So like when we do prairie work, we do 25 of these in a square that's, uh, you know, 70, well, let's put it in feet, 200 feet by 200 feet. We'll do 25 of these randomly designed within them. And it tells us what that particular spot looks like. When we do forests, you got to make that, you got to make that area bigger because there's fewer you know, if you think of this, every time I'm going to hit a plant, you get into some woods, half the time there's nothing. 
So you got to do more of them to capture. It's weird to think in a forest you got to do a larger area than you would in a prairie. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. You but get around a trunk. What's that? You have to get around. Yeah, you have to run the tree trunks. Hit a tree trunk. It's 100% white oak tree, <laughs> <laughs> which happens. Um, and in forest, it's weird because you have overstory, which is hard to sample. So you're you're kind of you got to do some weird things. But basically, we we collect data with these, and it gives us ecological information and, and at a scale, and gives us a, a system to to see things. So I thought I might just toss one over, and we could maybe run through the C list. The C list is not useful at all. The numbers mean nothing. They're only useful when they're when they're when they're averaged. You kind of average the er error out. You know, sometimes something might we give it a seven, but it may actually be an eight. Sometimes something might be a three, but it's actually given a four. We hope that those things average out, and that's a classic statistical tool that you can average error out over time. It's what an average does. It's the classic is, you know, the average weight of everybody in there, this tent might be uh, 180 pounds, only if I stood out. The, <laughs> but nobody may weigh 180 pounds. You know what I mean? It's just a, it's an arbitrary number. Question? No? Good. So I'll throw, it, I'll throw it down here. No real reason, rhyme or reason. Um, so you know, we're, if we're sampling, if we wanted to know what the status and what the what the botanical community of this spot was at this point in time, it would tell us something. But where it's really informative is if we come back ten years later and a year later, any given amount of time, and we see how has it changed, and we start seeing these progressions towards different. You know, longer lived, weedier, more conservative. You see how fluid these systems are. And um, like, like we do work with Prairie Foundation, they bought Coin Prairie, which is over by Pennsylvania Prairie, uh, eight years ago or so. And we, they're, they're starting, anytime MPF buys, purchases new property, we go in immediately after and, and get a baseline idea with data what that looked like. Because they've got sites they've had for 30 plus years and it's a lot of, well, I don't know. What is it? I think it used to look like this. No, it used to look like this. You know who would know is Bill. Well, Bill, well, he's dead. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Not you, Bill. <laughs> <clears throat> so, you know, it's nice to have baseline data. I often say, um, what if you found a magic trunk and open it up and Julian Steiermark, the, one of the first major botanists in Missouri, had collected data all over the place. And you could go back and say, wow, this, or uh, schoolcraft, people cite schoolcraft. You know, what if schoolcraft collected data? Then we would actually know what he's talking about. When you don't, it, it, it's loose, it's open to interpretation. You know, it's like, well, what did he mean by open? You know, what did he mean by prairie? So, good data leaves us numbers with scientific names that, that give us something. So we can go through and say, oh, does anybody want to keep a list? Yeah. So we got, uh, any other volunteers? Richard, you want to volunteer? Oh. I volunteered you. So we've got, we write them in code. So this is uh, Elimus McGregorii, which is E-L-Y-M-A-C-G-M-A-C. I don't spell well. <laughs> You'll find that I don't spell well. So Elimus McGregorii is a what? Maybe on the right page, but I don't know. Uh... Elimus... McGregory, right there, okay. is a six. So we got a six. What's the real name for that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> early, early wild rye. Early wild rye. <laughs> and uh, that's, a, that's one that is, it is early. It's the first one that comes up. If you know wild rye, if you see one that's earlier than the others in blue green, see that blue green color in it? It's the only one that does that. It's first one up. We used to call that Virginia wild rye. And there's two or three others as we walked between here that were also called Virginia Wild Ride that we now know are different species, totally different ecologies, different blooming times. You know, these are, we're constantly sharpening these skills. And that's why I like you know, the field work we do, that's one of our reasons we keep doing it is we're out here in the field. I've got numerous tick-borne illnesses and my knees are going out and I'm getting old, but we're starting to sharpen the tool what these, you know, we start realizing, oh, that one thing that didn't give us information, now we know it's actually three things that give us a lot of information. You don't know that unless you're interacting with it. Are yes, sir. Are you taking photographic records so that as your sharpness increases, you, you can... We do. Update? 
<laughs> we take photo points and uh, um, yeah, usually those are, those are wonderful for presentations so you can see what's happening. Um, here we go. That's growing in there. Probably don't have time for people to guess what things are, so I'll just say. This is horseweed. It's going to be uh, Coniza, C-O-N, Canadense. Like, what else we got? Oh yeah, here we go. Zero. So now we have a six and a zero. Yeah. So Coniza Canadense horseweed. You guys probably know what that is. We already did McGregor, uh, uh, the early wild rye. This was growing in there also. This is not early wild rye, but we used to call these the same thing. And um, the Hamilton's been great about, as soon as that was known, they started figuring out which ones they had and started sorting them out. Like, okay, well, we have different things. I think a lot of producers wouldn't do that. They'd be like, we're just calling it Virginia wild rye. But well, we, we did it because we liked some better. Okay, well, you you wanted to key in on which was working better. Yeah, that makes great sense. This one is is Elimus jejunus. Sorry. sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. You gotta go all the way back to the E's. Okay. But I think it's a six. Uh, e L Y. So you're not worried about a bias since you picked them out samples out of there. We're gonna do everything in that square. We try not to bias where we put the square. And, and you're going to take a percentage of what's in there? Yeah, so then once we do all the species, we estimate their cover, like what percentage of cover they have, and then we can rank um, their, it's called the relative importance value. What's their influence within the within the quadrat? And it's not perfect, but it, it gives us some structure. Jejunus. Uh, is it on the other? It is, next page. Oh, okay. At the top, probably. Alamus Jejuna oh, is a seven. Oh, seven. And Justin, I noticed that the Jejunus has a pretty nice big seed head already, so it is fairly early as well. So McGregory eyes up and its anthers are out and flowering. Jejunus, that's going to shoot up this oh, much so higher. Jejunus is not flowered yet. Yeah, it's just now, it's just now, it's birthing, it's crowning as we speak. What's funny though is, is real Virginia wild rye, it stops right there and flowers. So if you see a wild rye that's stuck in the sheath but it's flowered or fruited, that's true Virginia wild rye. There's, there's some other differences, but this will extend in another week, week and a half, it'll flower. It's like they're on two week schedules. First this one, two weeks later, Dejunus, two weeks later, Virginicus, two weeks later, Glabrofloris. And at the end of it, it's like canadensis and comes on. It's kind of fun how they're stratified in time, which makes sense because their pollen would get confused, mixed up otherwise. What's funny is if you disturb a system, like you, you come in and if you've got a system and those species are well sorted and you cause damage and disturbance, it'll throw them off kilter and they'll flower at the same time and they'll hybridize. Um, and then you, and so we go into, we go into places and we see hybrids um, quite a bit on natural areas and we usually say this is a sign that something damaging happened to the system at some point and now we're seeing hybrid things. We are starting to see native like Lespedeza virginica, the slender bush clover, it'll, it'll hybridize with Ceresia. If you, if you hit it hard enough, I want to get into it, but 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 plants. We think of plants as just they just they're robots. They just do things. They're not robots. They're very fluid. When something is damaged, when it, when something's persisting in a stable community, it's reproducing with itself and keeping that gene pool localized. But if you hit it hard and it it senses a stress to the stability, it will genetically open its system to other individuals. It'll open its genes a little wider. If you hit it even harder, it'll open it wide open in any port in a storm. And so you'll start getting species that hybridize as response to damage to a system, which sounds, we always thought, we're always taught that hybridity is a mutation and it's freakish and it shouldn't happen. It's functional in nature. Hybrids form, they usually have mostly sterile intermediates 
those sterols, you're like, okay, well, they're sterile. They can't go anywhere. They can back cross with the parentals. So you basically have this, this, this neutral zone of which you can, you can mix genes of two different species by back crossing. That's a functional part of nature. It's why two thirds of our body, two thirds of our genes are Neanderthal. If you buy that concept, um, at some point in time, some human in Europe was like, "Hey, those Neanderthals look pretty good to me." You know, <laughs> this is gonna, you know, <laughs> some, you know, they've been traveling a long time. Um, so that happens, but it but it gave us pale skin, larger nose, big chest cavity, so we could survive the cold climate of the north. It's an adaptive, functional feature. It's not a freakish, random event. Oh. Uh, What tarnation do we have here? That looks like a salvia. Salvia zuria. Is it possible a uh, blue stage? It probably wouldn't have planted it. Could it's it probably around, huh? Or wait, maybe it's not. No, it's not. I bet it smells like carrots. Kind of. I think it's a young sunflower. I'm not used to this kind of dynamic. <laughs> yeah, when we run across stuff like this, we're not completely sure. We collect it and try to try to figure it out later. Gosh. <clears throat> Let me look around. Oh, there's there's sawtooth or sawtooth here. I don't think it's sawtooth. I think it's Maximilian. If we can pass that around. You can see that it's it's got these opposite leaves. It's not quite folded, but it's it's hairy like hairy on the stem. Sawtooth isn't hairy on the stem. The Maximilian is going to be hairy all over. I think it's a young Maximilian. So Helianthus, H E L. From a grazing standpoint, do those different kinds of rye have a different nutrient value? Completely outside my wheelhouse. I don't know. Anybody? Uh, so they, they grow at different times. They're vegetative. When you would think about grazing them, uh, the early wild rye actually greens up and grows in colder temperatures, and it goes dormant when it quits growing in colder temperatures. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, and, and each one has a season, kind of has a season of growth, and when they start to seed head up, I'm sure the quality starting to go down. They put energy in the seeds about But it's always enough more nitrogen than what counts. Yeah, so it's, it's nutrient value is more time-based. Yeah. Than, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I gave you such a job here. Like is it the salt? It's going to be Max. Oh, oh Max. Oh, Maximilian, yeah. Oh, okay. Five. Five. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's uh, the... Yeah, the Alimus McGregorii is pretty much a riparian zone, usually a shaded woodland species, and Jejunus is a prairie upland species, so ecologically you're in different places. And if you're grazing a prairie, you're most likely to hit Jejunus than McGregorii. Little grass, reaching for my hand lens that isn't there. <laughs> this is a little, uh, the genus Muhlenbergia, the muley grasses or satin grasses. That's a, a small one of those. This is a, this is Muhlenbergia shrebri, M-U-H. It's actually native, but it's a little, it's often in your lawn. If you see a little grass like that in your lawn, this is often a common lawn weed that actually is native, they say. Let's see, which one? <laughs> shrebri, that one. Oh, sure Zero. That's why it's in your lawn. Your lawn has zero ecological value. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Muhlenbergia is a zero? Yeah, Shriver, yeah, it's native, but it tells you nothing about ecological oh, context, there's really. There's different Muhlenbergias. Right. Yeah, there's, there's higher ones. Okay. There's a couple of fives and sixes. Yeah, Shriver is just the little, little long well one. Oh. Zero might be a bit harsh, but... Uh, there's a leaf and a flower, white clover. Smells great. Um, that's not native, so we don't need to look it up. It's trifolium repens. Comes with its own tick. Uh, but an exotic that's in there. This is a plantain. This is a native plantain, Plantago rugelii, P-L-A, Plantago, which is a, 
Montego Rio. I think it's just called How Common Plantain might be the name on it. The plantains, fun fact, if you get stung by a bee or something, wad it up, chew it up, get it wet, bee sting, instantly stops stinging, so it's burning. How about tick bites? Tick bites makes it worse. Don't do it on tick bites. I don't know about tick bites. Is that a common, did you say? Oh, wait, common plantain. Oh, uh, let's go to Rugelii. Red stock plantain. I said the wrong common name. But it does have a C value. Probably the, also a zero. So these are lawn. I'm sorry, what's the species on that plantain? That is the Plantago uh, Rugelii. Okay. It's a zero. Uh, some Queen Anne's lace. In there, not native. Bah, bah humbug. Bah humbug. Queen Anne. You know why it's called Queen Anne's lace? You ever see you know the big lacy yeah. headdresses of people? Umbrella. Yeah, and the, like the queens would have like the big white lacy thing around their head. Queen Anne was beheaded. You ever see like the purple flower in the middle of a white mm -hmm. Queen Anne's lace? That's the stump <laughs> from the Queen Anne's <laughs> lace. <laughs> Sorry. What a story. It's a morbid story. <laughs> People used to be more gross than they are today, I guess. Uh, this is a poa, and not a native poa. We have nice native poas. We have a couple native fescues, right? This is just poa pretensis, the, the Kentucky bluegrass, like at a lawn. So we've got this lawn mixed with some, some conservative things. Yeah, which which we'd have to treat as as zeros. Um, there's a few other things in there, but I think this will run. I mean, we could go all day finding stuff. A, a plot like that, I imagine. I imagine there's five or six at least more things in there that I'd have to dig for. But you get the idea. When we do that in in most prairies, like a nice high quality prairie, we'll average. In those squares, 25 species. We There's actually a world record collection. People keep track of the world record of how many plants are in one quarter meter quadrat. We set that record yeah. uh, a couple of years ago with 46 species in that. All of them native on a prairie, Pennsylvania prairie. Uh, that, that plot, so that big plot area, it averaged 38. So it was, and when we were there, it was just magic. There were, the guy that was with me really knows uh, butterflies and moths. And he's like, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that before. What the heck is that? And there's like any, every assortment of bees. It was just really all the expressions of life because of the plant matter, you know, whatever, there's something that only eats that one plant and that plant, all those plants are all at one place. All those organisms are gonna be at one place and they all, you know, just like there's different layers and things fit in, there's different insects and pollinators and time schedules. It really is elaborate and intense when it's left over time and stabilizes. In the video description, there are links to other talks from this field day. Lauren Steele discusses why a diversity of plants is good for livestock. Elizabeth talks about how a diversity of plants above ground makes for a productive grassland as well as biochar's contribution to organic matter. Amy Hamilton looks below ground and speaks about how a diversity of root systems makes for a grassland that is stronger than a monoculture, and Colt Hamilton speaks about establishing a diverse native silvopasture or savanna.